Carl, give me the thumb when we're live, yeah? Okay, mo uh, afternoon, ladies and gents. We're going to get started. Uh, you're allowed to eat in here, but please, no litter. So, to paint the picture, I was 26 years old. I'd been living in New York City since uh, October 2000. I lived on, uh, in one of the boroughs of New York City called Manhattan. Manhattan is the famous one where lots of the rich and famous live. It is eight miles long by about a mile and a half wide. And I lived not far from Central Park on the Upper East Side. Okay, I lived on East 91st Street and 1st Avenue. Avenues went top to bottom, streets went across. I was single at the time. I lived there in an apartment that was from the front door to the window was the length of this. In there was a bedroom, a bathroom, and a kitchen. And it was, I was there for two years, from October 2000 until uh, just about November the something or other, 2002. And it was a pivotal time in my life. On Tuesday, the 11th of September, I had flown back the day before from a holiday with my mum and my brother in San Francisco. I'd left them in San Francisco because uh, I had to be back at work on the Tuesday. In, in America, that Monday was a bank holiday. I think it was a Labor Day, they call it, which is pretty much the end of their summer. Come on in. And I flew back to go to work. They remained in San Francisco. Uh, I'd gone from my apartment, the Upper East Side. I caught the subway, same as I always did and I was in my office. Now my office was on West 34th Street above something called Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden is where all the sports events happen in New York City. I was on the 19th floor and my aspect was from east to west. The windows, that's what I mean by that, were east and west. Now, north of me was Central Park and where I lived, south of me was the financial district and the World Trade Centers. These build, the World Trade Center were two buildings, 110 stories high, each story about 12 to 14 meters. So you can do the maths. When you were at the top of them, in the wind, they would swing three meters from left to right, or front and back, depending on the wind. And when you were up there, you could see the avenues lit up in Manhattan, in straight lines, because they were going north-south, south-north, sorry, and then you could see the streets going across. And when it moved, it was a very strange feeling, okay, because you could actually physically feel it moving. And as you know, on that day, four planes were hijacked at about the same time, most of them from Boston O'Hare Airport, and one of them ended up crashing into the Pentagon in, uh, in um, Washington, D.C., which is the military housing of America. Two planes crashed, one into each building. World Trade Towers sat like this behind each other, the south one and the north one. They were sort of offset so that you could see them both, and they were perfect uh, cuboids. They, as you can see here, they had a sort of mirror reflection and then this lattice work of steel, which went all the way from the bottom right to the top, okay? And the first plane that hit, hit about 8.48 in the morning, give or take a minute or two. I remember that because at 8.30 I had to start work. Every day in New York, I had a cup of coffee, or coffee as they like to call it, and then a bagel. So I was sat at my desk, we were just having our team meeting, and my boss, she was called Amanda Marquez, her husband rang, called Paul Marquez. Now Paul Marquez worked for Merrill Lynch, and Merrill Lynch was situated in a building called World Financial Center, which was just next door to the World Trade Center. And he rang while running away. Now, he was quite a big fellow, so we couldn't really hear what he was saying because he was out of breath. But he ran 
away because that had happened. Plane one had hit the building. Now, when he rang, I thought he meant a little two-person Cessna plane. Somebody who was out learning to fly had got it all wrong and hit a building. So we carried on with our team meeting. And then this happened. About, I'd probably say nine or 11 minutes later. Now, that second plane hit the second tower at exactly the point where my friend, Scott Scherzer, who was about 23 year old young man from New Jersey. New Jersey is a sort of industrial um, state in America just across the river from New York. So that's industrial and New York is full of um, rich, well-off people. And he'd got a job in New York and he'd finished American university or college as they call it and he'd got a job there. His office, where I had been before my holiday to San Francisco, because we just signed a deal to do recruitment for them, because that's what I did in America. The plane hit at about the 109th floor. He was on the 110th. If you Google the name Scott Scherzer later, you will see that he is listed on the people who died that day. Now, he wasn't my best friend. I didn't know him for long but we shared interests such as running. We were 25, 23, we shared interests like girls. And uh, we shared interests in going out and having fun. And we'd done that while we cemented this deal that we, that, we were, that we were working on. And I'll talk to you a bit more about Scott later because the reason I'm here today is, is quite a bit to do with Scott, okay? Now, that happened there. Later on, so as you can see, sorry, those planes, the reason they hijacked those planes, they were all going on long haul flights, long distance flights. They were full of aviation um, avgas, they call it, or airplane petrol. So they were really flammable. And as you can see, they created a fireball and a fire inside, which got so hot. Do you remember I talked to you about the lattice work of steel? That it became um, malleable, it became soft, and then the building collapsed in on itself. Okay, I will show you that, that point now if I can find it. Okay, now as you can see, that's the first tower that got hit collapsing in on itself. Each floor was hung on the, on the floor above. So it, it collapsed like a concertina, like you know those squeeze boxes people play for music? It, it fell on top of itself. And did you see the dust cloud? With that collapse, you remember you got thousands and millions of tons of steel, asbestos, which is, can cause lung problems, because they were built in 1978 or 79. Um, very sadly, vaporized human beings. Now, it was so burning, so intensely hot, the impact from the planes immediately killed lots of people. Okay? Now, I was on the 19th floor, as I said to you before, quietly sitting there, and we started to realize, even though we couldn't see, something was going really wrong. The news feed, the internet still worked, so we were looking at that. And we started to pick up the phone because we were all British. My wife now, my girlfriend then was in uh, Greece with her sisters. My mum and brother were in San Francisco. Okay, and my dad was back in Britain and all my friends were, you know, uh, going about their business. It's nine o'clock in America, it's one o'clock in Britain. I picked up the phone to just call a few people and say I was fine. Absolute silence. We went out to think, right, well, we better get out of here then. We went to the lift or elevator. Nothing was working. So we were on the 19th floor. We were confused. We were scared. And we couldn't make contact with anybody to say we were safe. 
So we waited and then uh, the building team came and said, right, it's time to evacuate. So we walked down 19 floors because the lifts, the elevators had stopped working. And on our way, we found people who were in uh, bad health or um, who were crying and we helped them down. Of course, the whole time thinking, we weren't sure if there were more planes in the air, if there was, you know, if they were missiles, what was going on. So we got our way downstairs just as the first one collapsed. And as I walked out, there was a breath. Have you ever seen the tube in London when there's a tube coming, the train pushes down the tube? It was like that, and then all of a sudden there was dust. And that dust there had reached all the way up to where I was. And it gave us our, our suits, we wore suits to work then, gave us a covering of that dust. Okay? And I, I didn't know what to do. For the first time in, in my adult life, I was, I was scared. And not a little bit scared. Sort of, I can't describe it. I've never been like it ever before or since. I had a, I, it wasn't a paralysis. I just had an idea I didn't need to be here. I needed to get out somehow. Now, I mentioned it's an, it's an eight-mile island by one mile. There's nowhere to go. The subway had shut down. The buses had shut down. There were police and fires raging down from the, from the north of Manhattan down to, to help people in there. Okay? So what this is about today is the fact that at that point, I could have st stood in my building. I could have gone this way, which was north, uptown, this way downtown. And I went this way, uptown. Do you remember I said I lived on the east side of the park? For some reason, I don't know, I went west. I went to the upper west side. Here's the park, here's me. And I went to 66th Street. And while I was there, I helped interview metal and steel workers who were coming in from the Bronx, Yonkers, from upstate New York as quickly as they could to come and cut the wreckage away of those buildings to try and find buried humans. I'll pass these round. They're some of my most uh, treasured pr uh, possessions. Please look after them and watch this. It'll, it could fall apart. They are from the American Red Cross. It just appeared at my apartment afterwards. I didn't know it was going to. And they're in my office here at Wellington Academy. I keep them by me the whole time. And I'll tell you why later. Um, when I was there, I was interviewing people, skilled workers who'd built skyscrapers, uh, were very well uh, qualified to go and save people. And it became obvious that there was no need for that. Because what had come back after the collapse was that as the firefighters were going up the building, walking up 110 floors with respirators on and air tanks and the police to put out the fire at the top that you can see, the building had collapsed and anybody who was in there still and the fire brigade and the police, there was no point digging for them because they weren't finding body parts. They had burnt to that point and they'd, uh, they'd been incinerated. Now, the reason I'm here is not to tell you that horrible fact. The reason I'm here is that Scott Scherzer died probably about 9.09 on Tuesday, September the 11th, when that plane hit not far from his desk. I like to think he died instantaneously because that plane was doing 500 miles an hour and it was fueled up to the max. So it was burning instantaneously at thousands of degrees. Yet, Scott Scherzer has me here speaking to the year sevens and everybody, probably had about 100 in there before, got you in here now, so that we never forget. Okay, it's not similar to remembrance. There was a human toll to this. Okay, it wasn't just a scary story, it was something that changed my life. On that day, one of my friends died, 
I decided for some unknown reason to take a, a step away from my house and help other people. And what I was doing before was only for me. It was about fun, money, and the sort of like pursuit of money, really. That's what I used to do when I was in business. Now I'm a head teacher, and I'll tell you definitively, on that day was the day I knew my real character was to go and help people in times of trouble. Not that school is times of trouble, but there's a way of doing that, and that's why I'm here today. Now, terrible things happen, sadly, but you can always look at these things and find something on the back end of it which is positive. Scott Scherzer died. He left a mother, a father, three siblings. I've done this assembly or talk a couple of times at schools I've been at. The first time I did it, I sent it to New Jersey to Mrs. Scherzer. And she sent me back a message to say, you know, thank you so much. Scott has never died in vain because you're still hearing the story and generations of children while I'm a school leader will hear the, hear the story, okay? I want to talk to you about the, the terror of it, really. Um, I've never felt anything like it before or since, really. It was that fear of sort of the unknown. And you're going to face those things in your life at some point. And what I want you to do is trust your character. Trust yourself. You will know what to do at that point, and it could point you in a direction that changes your life. So with all that tragedy, all those 4,000 and something people who died on that day, if me and thousands of other people affected by it have then gone on to affect the lives of others, then their lives were not in vain. Scott Scherzer did not die on that day. He died physically, but spiritually he did not. He's still here with me. He's now with you. He's a living entity on the internet. Okay? And there is a sense of legacy for his life because of that. Okay, I'll take any questions you have now, if you'd like to ask any. Yes, Alex. Well, my building wasn't collapsing. So I wasn't in that building. I was in another building. Okay? So I, I was further up, uptown, but I was away. But to, I'll answer the question. To get down the building was scary because I wanted to run as fast as I could, but I knew that would probably damage somebody else. And then we realized there were people who needed help. So we ended up carrying, because we were all 25, 26-year-old uh, men and women who were fit and strong. We ended up carrying unfit people, who were people with injuries. There was a lady in a wheelchair that people carried down those 19 stories. Because we couldn't leave them up there, could we, just in case? Okay, yes, young man. No, I did not. And that's a good point. Now, remember I said I was east-west? So... Um, I didn't see anything, and I thank my lucky stars I don't, because we all know that people actually were jumping because they didn't know what else to do. And that image, and what I haven't told you about is the smell. For two weeks after, that building burnt, and you see it's getting blown off. On that day, it was getting blown to Brooklyn, which is the borough behind it. Well, later that day, the wind changed, and it got blew to, uh, blown to me up at, by the park. And if I close my eyes and think about that smell, I can smell it even now. And it's steel, it's asbestos, it's dust, and it's humans. And the other thing that was happening that night to protect it, of course America went into lockdown, the American Air Force were flying grid patterns over Manhattan for the next two weeks, and their fighter planes would sonic boom across when they went over the buildings boom, on the water, and then they'd fly across, and I can still hear that now, because they'd fly these grid patterns across Manhattan. Okay, yes, young lady there with the, with the, with the poppy, yeah. No, I didn't, no, no. I, um, there were lots of British people who were in that building, but I only knew, knew Scott. Okay, yes. Yeah. 
Not about speaking about it, because I find joy in it now for Scott. But I tell you, that's a great question. Six months later on American telly, I was still living there, and they had, a, a, on a Sunday night, this thing called a CBS special, or 60 Minutes it's called, and they did it about six months after. And I rang my girlfriend, now wife, five hours behind at midnight, because I'd watched it from 10 till midnight, and I cried for the next four hours straight, inconsolably, and she kept saying to me, what's the matter, what's the matter, what's the matter? And I was trying to get out what was the matter, and I just couldn't. And, you know, I kept saying, like, 9-11! And, you know, so she sort of knew that, because I hadn't really thought about it until that point, and it hit me. The loss of life, the, how scared I was, etc. And there's no shame in that, feeling, uh, being scared, crying, all those sorts of things. People deal with it differently, but it was six months to the day. Great question. Yes. Uh, I think he was 23, could have been 25. He's between those two areas. Scott Scherzer. Yes, Amy. Yeah. I have literally no idea. I ask myself that question all the time. Remember I told you they're by my desk. If any of you are ever in my office, which I hope you're not, um, but for a positive reason, they're by my computer. And I ask myself that question a lot. And if I ever find out the answer, I'll let you know. Okay, yes. I knew him for about three months. We were doing a deal. In America, when you do a deal, you take him out for drinks and a bit of a party. You know, it's a bit of a courtship. And then we signed a deal before I went to San Francisco on holiday for two weeks. We came back, we were gonna start recruiting brokers. He was a bond trader. And, um, and then, boom. Okay, yes. I can't hear you. What, do the street, what did the streets look like? They looked like this. So, okay, thank you, without the blasphemy. Um, that's the site of the World Trade Center after they'd collapsed. Yes. Hang on a minute, there's a question here. If the hijackers, they took, they took uh, four planes. It might have been five, I can't remember. Yep. There were the two buildings. So the first plane hit one building, the second plane hit the other building. And then they both burnt independently. Okay, um, we're nearly running out of time for your lesson. Yes, down the front here. Don't know. Okay, question was, if I hadn't have gone away from my house and ended up you know, how, interviewing people, what would I have done? I'll tell you what I did when I got home. I got home that night and I thought, I don't really want to be on my own, I lived on my own. I was a runner at the time, I was a competitive runner, and I thought, I know what I do, I'll go for a run. I enjoy the process of running, it's calming to my brain. And I went to Central Park, I ran up the hill on York, uh, York Street where Mickey Rooney, the actor, was, bit, was born, and I went into Engineers Gate at Central Park at 90th Street on the east side, and straight away, I met a French guy I knew called Stefan, and he was out running. I ran with him. And then we met four or five other competitive runners who didn't know what to do bar run. So we ran, and we ran, and we ran, and we ran until we were exhausted. And then we all went home. And people say to me, did you sleep that night? And the answer is yes, because I'd run myself exhausted. Okay, one more question. Let's take the young man at the back, please. Does that make me a? No, no, no. There were survivors, but I was not one of them. I was nowhere, I was nowhere near uh, being in danger of the towers collapsing or, or the planes. Um, I was just living in that environment. Okay, that's all we got time for. Um, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Right, off to lesson.